Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 21 of History for Shut-Ins. Wearing my Johnny Cash shirt today, tribute to the man in black, also the family in black, known as the Brooks family of Havertown, Pennsylvania. Today, we are going to talk about the Industrial Revolution, as well as the presidencies of John Tyler and James K. Polk. So throughout several of the episodes, we have discussed the Industrial Revolution and the important role that it plays in the development of the country. We go back to the late 1780s, early 1790s, when Alexander Hamilton pushes the idea that America should become a manufacturing giant. We should no longer purchase our goods from European countries, but we should manufacture them here. One, keeping tax monies here, keeping revenues here and creating jobs. While the North jumps on that, as we see in the development of Boston, Providence, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, uh, Chicago, Cleveland, on and on and on. As manufacturing centers in the North are being set up, immigrants coming to America are moving to Northern cities to work in either the factories or in businesses affiliated with those factories. Down South, they are not as concerned about manufacturing because they have cotton. The cotton gym was invented in the late 1780s by Eli Whitney, which helped to revolutionize cotton production. Of course, a lot of Southern cotton is coming up to Northern textile centers, Philadelphia being one of the biggest. So the Industrial Revolution has a couple of phases. The first phase is anywhere from about 1750 to 1840 or so, and it takes place primarily in continental Europe, starting in Great Britain, and then it moves to North America. The second phase, which is really about 1840, 1850 to 1915, begins in America and then spreads to Europe. The American Industrial Revolution began in New England. Several large scale textile mills were established during the 18th, late 18th and early 19th century, which quickly expanded throughout the northern colonies, the northern states. The role of Massachusetts in the Industrial Revolution is pivotal because of these textile mills. It was called the cradle of the U.S. Industrial Revolution. Although the early American Industrial Revolution was largely confined to New England, it did spread to the West, and then after the second Industrial Revolution, penetrates the South. Causes of the first Industrial Re Revolution in the United States, the Embargo Act of 1807, which were a result of the Napoleonic Wars. They were intended to cut Great Britain and France off from the American market. Lack of access to foreign goods forced America to produce more of its own goods. The War of 1812, which included the British blockade of the American Eastern coastline. And what this does is it really forces America to focus more on manufacturing. Causes of the second industrial revolution in the United States. Think of the natural resources at hand. For basically the previous century, Europe has been fighting over control of North America because of our natural resources, timber, water, coal, iron, copper, silver, gold, on and on and on. The French and Indian War, in the 1750s and 1760s is fought to control the Ohio River Valley. Canals and railroads, which promote the growth of coal and steel, play a huge role. It helps to speed up the transport of goods west from the coastline. It increases mass production and also mass consumption. 
And then there is what is known as economic specialization. Rather than having 50 textile mills making the same items, they specialize in, the, in their output. There is an increased supply of labor. Manufacturing and improved infrastructure attract immigrants. Remember yesterday we were talking about how two thirds, or pardon me, three quarters of the immigrants in the 1830s and 40s come from Ireland and Germany. Laissez-faire politics, which was basically a lack of government regulation, allowed businesses to grow rapidly. It created big environmental issues and poor working conditions. New inventions that come about, electricity, the electric motor and such, and we'll talk about these things. In the early 1800s, the Northeast started to develop strong regional economies. By the 1820s, rural New England and the Mid-Atlantic became heavily industrialized with textile mills, clockmakers, shoemakers, cast iron stoves, things along those lines. They became the predominant industries in the Northeast, in, the, in New England and the Mid-Atlantic states. As factories produced more, transporting these goods became more important. In the 1820s and 30s, manufacturers found new ways to reach consumers in the West. The Erie Canal, which cut across New York and created a water route from the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, was completed in 1825. It's the Erie Canal which helps to propel New York City past Philadelphia as the financial capital, the political capital for a time, um, and really the economic capital of the United States. It was less expensive to ship something up the coast to New York, from New York to the Erie Canal, and then from the Erie Canal down into the Great Lakes, rather than overland from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. Less expensive, and it took a shorter amount of time. The Erie Canal was completed in 1825. Shipping goods through the canal decreased shipping costs via or when you compare it to ground transportation, as I mentioned. After the Western Steamboat was developed, around 1814, it allowed large cargo transported upstream in shallow water, which helped to spread industrialization in the West. And, and a key to this, remember, when we have the session of Florida and the Louisiana Purchase, what's one of the big things? And this comes into play during the Civil War. It's navigation of the Mississippi River. The U.S. having that allows goods from the Northwest territories, if you will, Detroit and such at the time, come down the Mississippi to New Orleans and then from New Orleans to Europe. In 1837, the federal government completed a 620-mile national road from Maryland to Illinois to help manufacturers get their goods westward. Midwestern industries of coal, iron, food processing, lumber, furniture and glass really increased while, North, while industries in the Northeast like textiles, shoes, clocks, expand to a global scale. The South became a supplier of raw materials, cotton, instead of developing its own industries. And this will come back to bite the South in the rear end during the Civil War. In 1850-ish, give or take, the second industrial revolution, which saw the spread of electricity, petroleum, think of John Rockefeller, Steel, think of Carnegie, began in the United States. Industrialization spread in the late 19th and early 20th centuries due to technological advances. In the 1890s, the United States surpassed Great Britain for number one in the world in manufacturing. And by the beginning of the 20th century, per capita incomes in the United States were two times that of Germany and France, and 50% more than Great Britain. 
America was now the largest economy in the world. This is what's drawing immigrants from all over the world, why we see these waves of immigration. Inventions. So we mentioned the cotton gin. That's in 1793. The McCormick Reaper, invented by Cyrus McCormick in 1831. The steel plow, which was invented by blacksmith John Deere, a very familiar name, in 1837. Samuel Morse invents the telegraph in 1844. Vulcanized rubber is invented by Charles Goodyear in 1844. The sewing machine in 1846 by Elias Howe. The safety brake for elevators by Elijah Otis in 1853. And why is that important? Because big cities can no longer spread out they're going up. And we will see that big time in the early to mid 20th century. The Bessemer process, which was introduced and invented by Henry Bessemer in 1856. Of course, the telephone in 1876. So all of these inventions are feeding the American economy. The Industrial Revolution caused rapid urbanization with people moving from the countryside to cities. In 1800, 6% of the American population lived in cities. By 1900, it is 40%. By 1920, the vast majority of Americans live in cities. The Industrial Revolution helps to spread unskilled labor. Prior to the 19th century, most Americans were not employed in agricultural perform uh, in agriculture performed a skilled trade. Industrialization made apprenticeships obsolete and really helped to put a monetary value on labor. What happens with the growth of unskilled labor is labor unions, and we'll talk about that. Let's come onto the scene because of the poor working conditions and, and low wages. Unions came about because workers had little political support as many were immigrants and women who were not allowed to vote. New economic changes led to social, social and cultural transformations. You have the formation of a lower class, a middle class and an upper class. And in that middle class, entrepreneurs, business, law and medical professionals. Professionals. So the Industrial Revolution plays a large role, really starting about the time we're talking now. We're going to talk about the 1844 election with John Tyler and uh, Mr. Polk. So by the end of his term in office, John Tyler had been drummed out of the Whig Party and he was vilified by the Democrats. His followers held a convention and nominated him as a third party candidate for the presidency but he really stood no realistic chance of winning. Whigs nominated Henry Clay, a name that we seem to hear again and again and again. Many Democrats nominated James Polk, who was seen as a dark horse candidate. He was largely unknown from the state of Tennessee. Clay's support was very narrow. No one knew what to make of Polk because he was, you know, politically didn't say a lot, and it was vastly unknown. Tyler felt his advantage lay in the powers of the presidency. He used his position to try to move the Texas annexation issue to another vote and hopefully ride that to victory. Again, we have the Texas flag behind us because the annexation of Texas remains a major issue. And one big reason is the fear is it will come into America as a slave state, throwing the slave and free states out of balance. So the Texas issue is what Tyler is hoping to win uh, or ride to victory. Although he wins annexation, it did little to improve his chances. Polk comes out publicly for Texas statehood, which takes some of the wind out of Tyler's sails. Jackson, who's still around, Andrew Jackson, who still wields considerable power, sent word to Tyler. If Tyler withdrew from the race, Jackson, 
told Tyler that he would have the pleasure of wiping out Henry Clay as well, because everybody would then vote for Polk. Tyler and Polk might split the vote and hand Clay the White House, but in a two-person race, Clay would not win. Tyler withdrew in late August and threw his support behind Polk, who narrowly won. Although Tyler vetoed a bill to resurrect the Bank of the United States, his entire cabinet resigned in protest, with the exception of Secretary of State Webster, then in sensitive negotiations with Great Britain. Conservative Democrats were pressed into service to take over the cabinet but they came and went with great frequency. The second year of Tyler's presidency was as rocky as the first. Congress had passed two bills calling for higher tariffs. He vetoed them both. Whigs began impeachment proceedings even after Tyler signed a bill worded to their liking. Vindictive and purely political, the impeachment proposal was bottled up in Congress. Sound familiar? Tyler was censored by a select committee dominated by Whigs. Tyler demonstrated that a president without popular or party support could exercise Jacksonian types of exclusive powers and privileges. Whigs could not get their national bank, high tariff, or distribution bill to give the proceeds of the sale of public lands to the states for internal improvements. What internal improvements? Infrastructure to get all these manufactured goods westward. Henry Clay proposed a constitutional amendment so that Congress could override presidential vetoes by a majority vote. Neither this amendment nor proposals to impeach Tyler could pass Congress. Tyler could not set domestic policy, but he demonstrated that a president willing to exercise his constitutional powers could block a congressional majority from doing so. Ty Amidst all of these issues, Tyler had personal tragedies. His wife, Letitia, had been ill for some time, and in September of 1842, she died from a stroke. After five months, he began courting a very sought after social life in Washington, D.C., by the name of Julia Gardner. She was 22, 32 years younger than Tyler, and even younger than some of Tyler's seven kids. Texas declared its independence from Mexico five years before Tyler became president. Tyler hoped to draw support for a new political party that he was attempting to form by leading a drive to annex Texas and make it a state. Mexico considered Texas its own and threatened war with America if America interfered. Also troubling to many Americans was the prospect of yet another slave state joining the Union, which would upset the sectional balance in Congress. Tyler, he's a slave owner. He's a state's right champion. And based man without a party saw Texas as his ticket back to political viability. His new party, the Democratic Republicans, used Tyler and Texas as a party, as a slogan, pardon me. The Democratic Republicans, Tyler basically recycled that name from Jeffersonian times. Tyler made a serious tactical error that ruins his plans. In 1844, for Secretary of State, he appointed John C. Calhoun. Since Texas was still another nation, negotiations to secure its statehood fell to Calhoun and his pro-slavery views made abolitionists very uneasy. His message to Congress contained a long, eloquent defense of slavery. Van Buren, who stood around, eager to avenge his loss to Harrison and Tyler in 1840, deployed his skills at backstage maneuvering and lobbying to doom the annexation treaty. The proposal for statehood failed to pass in the Senate, even with Andrew Jackson's party support.
Tyler was determined to make Texas the focus of his reelection bid and submitted a joint resolution that needed only a majority vote in the House and Senate, which it ended up getting. Tyler signed the Texas statehood bill into law on March 1st, 1845, three days before he left office. Congress relished directing a final insult at Tyler on his last day in office, it overrode his veto of a minor bill to fund some small ships for the government. Tyler's foreign policy decision-making went much more smoothly than domestic, recognizing the coming importance of the Asia Pacific region to trade, he sent a key diplomatic mission to China. This move resulted in commercial and consular relations with China, giving America the same trading concessions as Great Britain. Tyler spread the principles of the Monroe Doctrine to Hawaii, warned the British to stay away from the Hawaiian Islands, and began the process toward their eventual annexation by the United States. Of course, Hawaii doesn't come, become a state for another century. Closer to home, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty of 1842, negotiated by Secretary of State Daniel Webster, settled a long-time feud with Great Britain over where Maine ended and British ruled Canada. War had narrowly been averted between the two nations on several occasions over border and incursion issues. The treaty was instrumental in bettering diplomatic relations. With respect to Native Americans, Tyler ended a costly and bloody war against the Seminoles. After defrauding Native Americans of much of their remaining lands in 1833, America waged a bloody but inconclusive war against Chief Osceola. Tyler announced the end of hostilities in 1842. He continued his predecessor's expansionist policies in the Northwest. He pushed for a chain of forts from Council Bluffs, Iowa, to the Pacific, but was unable to conclude a treaty with the British to fix boundaries of the Oregon Territory. Tyler could claim an ambitious, successful foreign policy due largely to his Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, who served from 1841 to 1843. The U.S. grew 18% during Tyler's presidency. That's unbelievable. Immigrants poured in from Ireland, Germany, and other parts of Northern Europe. By the end of Tyler's term, the vast growth and democratization of American electorate had run its course. In almost all states, all white males were eligible to vote. In the last election, 80% voted. In all states except South Carolina, delegates to the Electoral College were now chosen by the people directly rather than state legislatures. This change in the electoral process put the presidency on a firm popular base rather than the preceding federal base. During Tyler's administration, America remained assertive, pushing its territorial claims. Tyler's signing of the Log Cabin Bill allowed Western settlers to buy 160-acre tracts of land for $200. This promoted westward expansion of the electorate. Oregon was a focal point. The annexation of Texas also secured America's position in the South. This strategy laid the groundwork for Polk's presidential successes in conquering Mexican territory all the way to the Pacific. Let's see here. So slavery continues to grow. The natural spread of African, of the African American population in the South meant that slaves grew twice as fast as freemen, that part of the population. Slave codes did nothing to protect plantation and farm slaves from poor treatment. Although there was no rebellion to match Nat Turner's effort of 1831, 
in the 1840s, there were numerous spontaneous uprisings and efforts to escape. Those who were caught were shot, hung, punished severely, or sold. By the end of Tyler's term, slavery was so deeply rooted in the South that it would not be eliminated peacefully. Of course, it's through the Civil War. Harrison's death demonstrated for the first time the importance of nominating a vice president who was qualified for the presidency. Once in office, many Americans felt that Tyler lacked the temperament and political skills to be the president. It could be argued that the stubbornness that undermined Tyler's work as president led to his greatest contribution to the executive branch. By claiming the right to a fully functioning and empowered presidency, instead of relinquishing the office or accepting limits on his power, Tyler set a crucial precedent. While the first veto override on his last day in office brought little joy to Tyler, it was also vital in establishing the critical system of checks and balances. The orderly transfer of power at the beginning of Tyler's term and the veto override that ended it demonstrated that the system of checks and balances worked. Tyler proved much better at taking over office than at being president. He refused to politically compromise his positions with Congress. Leaders of his own party were frustrated by his stubbornness. In most cases, the vice presidents who assumed the presidency have been successful when they have made a strong effort to make good on their predecessor's promises. Think of Truman taking over for FDR. Think of Johnson taking over for JFK. Those who deviate from the policies of the man who was elected often come to political grief, the notable exception being Teddy Roosevelt. Much of the South's political power moved west Qualms about sl slavery grew and America utilizing an increasingly nationalist activist system of government spread. A states rights championing slave owning pop plantation aristocrat from Virginia, which is what Tyler was, by 1841, he was largely out of touch with America. His affinity for the old Southern way of life gave him little connection with Americans who lived outside of it. So we will now move on to James K. Polk. Under Polk, America grew by more than a million square miles, adding territory that now composes the states of Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, Oregon, Indiana, Washington, New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado. So basically, the West. More than any other president, Polk pursued what was known as manifest destiny, a phrase coined by a fellow Democrat, John L. O'Sullivan, to express the thought that God ordained America to spread its Republican institutions across North America. Polk accomplished every major goal that he set for himself as president and successfully waged war against Mexico, obtaining for America most of its present boundaries as a war. Martin Van Buren came with a majority of delegates pledged to him on the first ballot, but many Democrats opposed Van Buren. Some thought he had lost or that he was a losing candidate given his unpopularity in 1840 when he had lost decisively to the Whig candidate, William Henry Harrison. What were termed young Democrats judged Van Buren as a member of the old dynasty. Southern men were upset that Van Buren recently came out in opposition to the annexation of Texas. It was this concern for victory and new faces that moved the anti-Martin Van Buren forces to insist that Democrats follow the precedent of the previous Democratic 
conventions by requiring a two-thirds vote. When Van Buren announced his opposition to annexing Texas, he basically commits political suicide. It was a decision he knew would make it hard to bring Southern Democrats to his side. He reasoned that to support annexation, which President Tyler surprisingly proposed, would lose him his home state of New York and any chance for decreasing the growing anti-slavery sentiments of the Northeast. His only hope when the convention opened was that while he could not easily get the two-thirds vote required, no other candidate had a better chance. His strongest opponent was Louis Cass of Michigan, the former minister to France and Jackson's secretary of war. He came to the convention with the solid support of Delaware, Virginia, Mississippi, and Tennessee, but far behind in the delegate count. When balloting began, Van Buren peaked on the first ballot, then lost delegates while Cass gained them. On the fifth ballot, Cass overtakes Van Buren. Seeing he would never be nominated and furious with Cass, Van Buren threw his support behind Polk on the ninth ballot. Early on the morning of May 31st, Democrats nominated George M. Dallas from Pennsylvania for vice president and presented the party platform. Strict construction of the Constitution and opposition to the Whig's American system of a national bank, high protective tariffs, and federally funded internal improvements. The platform denounced federal in interference with, quote, the domestic institutions of the several states, unquote, slavery. With regards to Western expansion, Democrats committed to the, quote, reoccupation of Oregon and the reannexation of Texas at the earliest practicable period, unquote. This was a compromise between Southern Democrats who wanted immediate annexation and Northern Democrats who had their doubts. At, the co at their convention, pardon me, the Whigs nominated Henry Clay, who else, on the first ballot. This was a bold attempt to distance the party from Tyler, whose fights with his cabinet and the Whig party left him without support. When Tyler vetoed in succession two Whig bills creating a new national bank, his entire cabinet resigned in protest. Hoping to create a new constituency, Tyler then endorsed, contrary to Whig sentiments, immediate annexation of Texas, as we've discussed. After nominating Theodore Freelingheisen of New Jersey as vice president, who was an evangelical Christian with anti-slavery views, the Whig party adopted its first ever platform. It supported high tariffs, restrictions on the presidential veto, and a one-term presidency. Convinced that the election would propel the well-known Clay into the White House, and Freeland Heisen's views on slavery might help in the Northeast, most Whigs paid little attention at first to the new anti-slavery Liberty, Liberty Party, which nominated former Democrat James G. Bernie of Michigan. Polk had more to fear since other than anti-slavery, the Liberty Party's platform mirrored that of the Democratic Party. But Bernie also hated Clay. Because Clay came out decisively against immediate annexation of Texas and Polk firmly supported it, the campaign presented a clear choice to the electorate. Once Clay realized that the new Liberty Party might pull enough wigs to hurt him, he tried to prevent him or present himself as an enemy of slavery by the fact that he opposed the immediate annexation of Texas. Because he was a slaveholder, it convinced most abolitionists that Clay would do little as president to hinder slavery. On the other hand, the more he identified himself as an opponent, of slavery's expansion, the less chance he had for winning the South. Polk, who was also a slaveholder, 
vowed to serve one term as president and restated his commitment to the annexation of Texas, but also to obtaining clear title from Great Britain to all of the Northwest between the latitude of 42 degrees south and 5440 north, present day Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and much of British Columbia, allowing his supporters to use the campaign slogan 5440 or fight, Polk balanced the idea of a new slave state, Texas, entering the Union with the possibility of a new free state, Oregon, joining the Union. Both candidates kind of danced around the fringes of the issues. Polk, who had always opposed high tariffs, confused matters when he tried to assure Eastern Democrats that he understood their needs to have protective tariffs imposed on foreign goods. As a result, much of the campaign centered on personal attacks. Although Polk had been Speaker of the House of Representatives, Jackson's point man in the bank war, governor of Tennessee, the Whigs mocked him as a nobody. Whigs blanketed the nation with hundreds of thousands of anti-Polk tracts, accusing him of being a puppet of the slaveocracy and a radical who would destroy America over the annexation of Texas. They circulated a false story alleging Polk sold many of his slaves to slave traders over the years. In those days, nobody had a more negative reputation than roaming slave traders of the Old South. Democrats responded, slandering Clay as a man who had violated every one of the Ten Commandments. There were rumors of his womanizing habits in Washington, D.C. brothels. In the South, Democrats employed racist language and accused Clay of being an abolitionist. When the balloting finished, Polk had beaten Clay by a razor thin margin. 1.338 million popular votes to Clay's 1.3 million popular votes. Clay won five slave states. Polk won 170 electoral votes to Clay's 105. Bernie, who had accused Clay of secretly planning to annex Texas, won a little bit more than 62,000 votes. In New York, Bernie won more of the, number of the number of votes Clay needed to carry the state, handing it to Polk. Had Clay won New York, he would have defeated Polk in the popular vote and by a slim margin of 141 to 134 in the Electoral College. Bernie kept Polk from, or kept Clay from the presidency. Polk assumed the presidency without having won a majority of the popular vote, although he won a plurality of it. His election was the closest in American history, and it demonstrated that a mature two-party system had emerged. Polk's agenda, unlike that of Tyler and Harrison, was largely driven by foreign policy, territorial growth, and foreign trade. Each of these had profound domestic consequences, the former in terms of slavery and the latter in terms of what to do about tariff levels. Polk promised during the campaign to revive the independent treasury system first enacted by, in 1840 by Martin Van Buren, but repealed in 1841 by a Whig-dominated Congress. Polk intended to address four of the most contentious issues of the era, each having sectional implications, territorial expansion, slavery, banking, and the tariff. Slavery was the least debated at the national level. The Mexican War changed this. This is where we are going to end for today. Thank you all that joined. We will pick up again tomorrow at 5 p.m. Moving forward with the Polk presidency and then talking about the Mexican-American War and the presidency of Zachary Taylor. If there are any questions, please feel free to leave them here and I will gladly answer them for you. Thanks again for joining and I will see you tomorrow. Have a good night.